three, four, five G. Welcome to another spectacular, epic meeting. Oh my God, BT, Adva, Ericsson, back to back, looking for partnerships. Let's start. Let's get rolling. It's only six years ago since we first started hearing about 5G replacing 4G generation on mobile phone networks in Europe. Network providers have set themselves goals to make 5G networks offer 1,000 times the bandwidth to cope with billions of new wirelessly connected devices. And all this while using 90% less energy. In 2020, initial 5G developments have started. In many countries, you can already purchase a 5G-enabled mobile phone and a 5G connection. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We expect significant rollout of 5G around 2023. We are going to connect everything and everyone in glorious 8K video. 5G is going to drive a future world with autonomous car, real monitoring of air pollution, constant evaluation of the body conditions, the futuristic world of sci-fi movies is around the corner. 5G is all about minimizing propagation losses of millimeter waves. On January 25th, I'm going to open up a discussion around commercial technical challenges ahead for photonics in 5G. Photonics has the magic secret, beam forming, beam steering techniques, plus all optical interfacing to multiple input and multiple output antennae. This is critical for increasing spectral efficiencies and providing cost-effective, reliable coverage with nearly zero latency. Take the European initiative Blue Space. Top companies worked and dreamed together to rethink the possibilities of photonics-enabled 5G base stations. Huge investments have also been made in Wi-Fi over fiber, so data at radio frequency could be sent in a fiber to a remote server without the need of a router. This result in lower cost, maximum efficiency and security. And the big one, interconnection of an ever-growing number of 5G base stations require a new generation of transceivers with low maintenance, easy to install and easy to calibrate. We are happy to see that companies like Verizon have invested in transceiver younger cells like Peak Advanced. So, as a rollout of 5G accelerates, what does the next boom in telecom business look like? We are doing what Epic does best, bringing all the main players together. Of course, we will ask the Epic question to the major operator British Telecom, the 5G network architect Ericsson, and one of the leading optical networking equipment manufacturers, Adva. Our discussion of real-world 5G technology business opportunities kicks off at 3 p.m. on Monday, January 25th. Our soon room will be at full capacity with the world's best telecom brains. Or watch the debate live, in real time, or anytime on the Epic YouTube channel. Jose, so when do you want 5G? As soon as possible. Thank you very much for joining another another epic meeting. I'm so happy because today, today is a topic I've been working on for many years with many of the people around the room. It's a group of friends which I'm bringing together and see what we can do for each other. Today, once again, I have to say thank you so much, all the members, for giving us so much work. Our job is to know individual technology of all the members, and now we have 670, so it's becoming a fantastic nightmare. I love it. I love Please continue joining Epic. If you want to be part of this, if you want to be a member of Epic, drop me an email and I will tell you how to make sure that your logo is here. And most important, make sure that you interact with what is now the leading and largest photonic association. I also would like to say that Epic keeps growing as well. We have now 15 employees. Today, you're going to meet Tracy Vanik, who is our head of photonics market research. And her job is going to be to provide one market report per month to all the members. We are working very hard on that. Apart from this, I keep saying, we organize events, we provide access to the network, we help you raise capital, and we have the biggest website to find a job in photonics, www.jobsinphotonics.com. And also, we already have announced, and we are already in chapter five of the season three of the Epic Online Technology Meetings. Today, 5G, on Wednesday, 4 and 6, and next week, pay special attention to the one that we have on Wednesday, 3rd of February, mid-infrared photonics, a huge, huge market ahead. And also this year, 
and everybody knows this, and especially Andrew Lord, who is one of our quantum people, we are supporting the quantum technology. We're actually doing that by organizing six online quantum technology meetings with end users all the way to people developing single photon sources, single photon detectors, anything in the quantum world. This is going to be fantastic. The first one is 12 of February. If you want to know what this is about, or if you have a technology suitable for the quantum market, do not miss any of these online meetings. And that's all today. 5G. First of all, I would like to acknowledge our media partner, Azo Optics. Thank you so much for the great effort you are doing promoting, promoting all these fantastic meetings. I also would like to say that in this particular market and any data con telecom market, Epic has partnered with Kobo and with Ethernet Alliance. They are fantastic partners. Thank you very much for interacting with us and make sure we align the companies in the data con telecom markets and today on 5G. And this event wouldn't be possible, would at all not be possible. I wouldn't do it without the support of our three sponsors today. The first one, Accenture is all the way from Switzerland. If you're looking for a partner developing micro optics, the right partner for the wafer level optics manufacturing, developing the right optics for the incapping or coupling of light, Accenture is your partner of choice. But if you're looking to have fantastic filters, you go all the way to Canada. Hello, Iridian. Iridian has been one of the leading optical filter suppliers since 1998, actually providing high quality, low cost, and their specialties go from WDN, OEDN, GFF, anything that you need for the right, right optical filter for Datacom Telecom. And the company that is really leading the European micro optics revolution. If you want the best micro optics in the world, you come to Europe. If you want a company who has positioned themselves as the leading one, SUS micro optics, the company that based on low cost replication of micro optics, they actually have addressed every market, but in the market of data con telecom, working already with many of the big players, developing the right micro optics for the co-packaging. What a great, great set of sponsors. Thank you so much. And what a great R&D manager with me today. All the way from Barcelona, Ana González. Buenas tardes. ¿Qué hay hoy? Buenas tardes. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jose, for your kind introduction. Uh, I am very happy to be here today to talk about photonics for 5G applications. As you can see uh, here in the agenda, we will have the main market leaders in 5G technologies, uh, BT, Adva, Ericsson, Big Advance. But this is just the starting uh, point, and these talks will trigger very interesting discussions with all the companies attending the meeting, and that are ready to participate in the discussion. Thank you for registering. Uh, today we have a great supply chain. Uh, so yes, at the big meetings, we want to take into account the needs and challenges uh, that the end users bring to us. Uh, so today we have a great list of end users such as Amazon, ESA, Ericsson, Hyperloop. Uh, we have the companies offering vertically integrated networking solutions. Uh, Cisco, Melanox, uh, Microsoft. And then we have companies offering uh, transceiver modules, packaging, uh, assembly, companies doing software, testing, optics. Uh, and then I would like to mention some of the initiatives, the European initiatives in which we are participating. The Passion Project, for example. Passion develops a new architecture for Metro Network that includes uh, transceivers in which the pixels are integrated directly in silicon photonics. Finally, I would also like to mention the pilot lines in photonics participating in this event. Uh, these pilot lines are working together, developing standard solutions for manufacturing of photonic devices, such as the JPEX pilot line, which offers large volume manufacturing of new phosphide photonic integrated circuits, but also the PIXA pilot line, which offers packaging and assembly of these chips. Also very linked to the supply chain for PIX, we have Fabulous, that is for high volume fabrication of preformed micro optics. And um, last but not least, Photon Hub. Photon Hub supports European companies that are not experts in photonics to develop new products based on photonic technologies. Uh, and if you want to know more about uh, any of these initiatives, uh, please feel free to contact us. Uh, and back to you, Jose. Thank you so much, Anna. What a great job you have done bringing so, so many companies and most important, bringing reasons for them to collaborate. Time talks space on the timing, for example, design houses like VLC Photonics and companies like Ericsson are going to find ways of working together today. This slide only corresponds to the companies who registered for this meeting. So you're an Epic member and you're missing your logo here. That only means that you didn't register for that meeting. Please do not let this happen again. You already know the calendar of the upcoming events. And with this, 
this now, I would like to say just quickly hello to the people who are following this meeting in YouTube. Hello, YouTubers. If you want to get into the Zoom room, quickly send me a WhatsApp. But if you are comfortable there, it's okay. You can stay there. If you have any question, please post the questions in the YouTube chat, and I will make sure that you read them, that they read them into the room. And also, this is valid for the people in the Zoom room. We have an internal chat. We have an internal chat. So use it to talk to each other during the presentations. Try to make sure the best that you make the best of these two hours. And if you want to get in touch with all the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.poto at epic-asoc.com. And I will make sure that I make this fantastic introduction just because, because I love doing that. And now I would like to say that this meeting, of course, is in collaboration with the Ethernet Alliance. And we have is more than a friend now. We have Jim Theodoras, a person who I think has the record on introductions and follow-ups in the history of the European Photonic Industry Consortium. Jim, good afternoon here in the Netherlands. What time is it for you? Uh, it is uh, the same, 3.10. 3.10 in the afternoon. What's, uh, what's the Ethernet Alliance doing in the business of 5G? <laughs> well, here, let me uh, share my screen and I would love to, uh, to talk about it. All right, thank you. So uh, the, the Ethernet Alliance, uh, it's, it's, it's all things Ethernet. Uh, we began over 10 years ago uh, as an, a group, as just a way of uh, pooling resources to go to all the myriad shows, which I guess in 2020, a lot did not occur, but there's so many shows and you want to go to them and do things. And it was a way of pooling resources, but it grew into so much more. And a lot of uh, amazing chairs and directors over the last decade did an amazing job of growing now the Ethernet Alliance to represent all things Ethernet. And, um, oh, here, let me, uh, here we go. And now it's become, it's kind of all things Ethernet are the Ethernet Alliance. And it's much more than just a marketing outreach group. It really promotes industry awareness, acceptance, um, technology awareness, uh, facilitates interoperability. It, it does a little of everything. And Ethernet is no longer just that thing you plug into your Wi-Fi router. Uh, it's become a protocol of choice for all physical FIs and ways of communicating. Uh, my, my joke is when my kids pull a string between two cans, they're, they're really talking in Ethernet because it's, it's just become ubiquitous everywhere. Uh, and that's what the Ethernet Alliance is kind of all about. And you think, well, wait a minute, doesn't the IEEE do Ethernet? Yes, the IEEE um, authors Ethernet specifications and standards, but there's so much more to bringing a technology to market where the, the IEEE not only doesn't do, they're not allowed to go into these spaces um, for various uh, um, uh, laws and regulations. So the, the Ethernet Alliance, is all things Ethernet and helps make these things happen. So I just, you know, there's limited time today. I just want to touch on a couple of the amazing things that the Ethernet Alliance does. Uh, one big thing is interoperability testing. Uh, all these standards and interfaces just keep getting more and more complex. Uh, the move to PAM4 is very complex. And uh, my affiliate, so I'm uh, employed and affiliated by HG Genuine, um, but today my affiliation is Ethernet Alliance. And, uh, we joined the Ethernet Alliance uh, to attend these plug fests because our first PAM 400 gig transceivers, we needed a way of knowing quickly and easily, do they work with everybody else's stuff in a confidential way? And I'll be open and I'll say our PAM 4, we did discover one issue in our PAM 4 encoding, we had one bit flipped. And it was very easy once we discovered that to just flip it back and now everything worked fine. Had we not gone to that plug fest, we would not have known that and we might have shipped products well in advance of that. But don't forget, it's not just about optics. I know Epic's a lot about optics, it's about all things ethernet. And there's so many devices out there today which draw their power from the ethernet. So power over ethernet. So it's not just power going over your twisted pair. It's gotten very complicated. There's a handshake that occurs. Okay, who just plugged into me? What voltage? How much current should I give you? Is there a trip limit? Should I even let you turn on? There's this massive handshake that occurs. And so the Ethernet Alliance now has this POE certification program where we validate that you meet this myriad of confusing POE standards. You know your device that when it comes to market is certified to function properly. Um, so another uh, 
function that we uh, provide is what we call technology uh, exploration forums. Uh, and these are just a meeting of the minds to work out the really hard problems of the industry in a neutral environment. Um, and then a second thing is shared space at trade shows. Yeah, most companies have their own booth. We had our own booth. But to go to the EA booth, you have a neutral ground where you can plug in, talk, you know, play with competitors and interoperate and connect where you're in neutral territory and everyone's allowed. And it's all about the technology, not necessarily about the competition. Um, and speaking of TEFs, this is my last slide. I'll, I'll wrap it up here. We are very fortunate because this week is a TEF. Uh, we're holding the 2021, the Road Ahead TF this week, every day at 1 p.m. East uh, Pacific time. You can dial in and see a session. Uh, so I encourage you to go. To, it's free. You can't get any better than that. It's an amazing program with great keynotes and great speakers and panels. Once a day, just dial in register and come and listen to it. It's going to be amazing. I've put the link there on this slide and I'll, I'll put it in the chat and maybe we can forward that to the YouTubers out there. But uh, 1 p.m. every day this week, you don't want to miss it. It's free and it's, it's, it's about what's next with Ethernet. And that's Ethernet Alliance. Well, the Ethernet Alliance is great, and we are so happy to have you as a partner of Epic. Thank you very much for being here. Jim Theodoras also represents AG Genuine, AG Tech, and he's been Quite, quite a fantastic following up on all the emails that we continue being introducing you. Thank you very much, G. Jim. And now we start. Oh my God, the first speaker today requires no introduction, but I'm gonna do it because I love him so much. All the way, all the way from the US, we go to Fiverr Reality. We go to Mark Lukovic, the person who tells his truth. We go to Mark to tell us about the 5G market, a market who he has been working like crazy over the last two months. I know because I've been working with him on that. Mark, tell us about 5G. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Mark Lukovic. I have you muted. Is the sentence, you are muted. The sentence of the COVID-19 times, you are muted. Mark, we need to find a way to unmute you. Okay. So we still have you muted and there is nothing else I can do apart from entertaining the audience. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, can you see my slides? Not yet. <laughs> oh boy. So we are only halfway through. So if we went from Europe to US, we will be Azores Islands now, beautiful place by the way. Uh, okay. Ponta Delgada in Azores, a beautiful city. You ever had the chance to go there on holidays? Go there and see fantastic whales. Uh, so you go to the bottom of the Zoom window, the bottom of the screen in the Zoom window, there is an arrow up, it says share screen. If you click there, then you can select which window to share. And then we can start the business. When we figure this out, I would like to say that uh, Epic is now developing, uh, co-developing with market analysts one market report per month. Um, we expect to have a, a, a market report on 5G, I think it's uh, mid of February, but the official date will be told by our head of photonics market research, Tracy Vanik, who started working for Epic on 1st of January. And so excited to have Tracy with us. Uh, Mark, how are we doing? Uh, getting there. You want to go with the second speaker? Uh, well, you, I want to go with the first one, but if the first one is, uh, <laughs> you prefer if I go with the it's second the one? First one yes, yes. All right, so this is very good. I go to the United Kingdom. And why do I go there? First of all, because British Telecom was one of the leading telecom operators in innovation in Europe. And British Telecom is here to tell us about the 5G network deployment in the UK. Thank you very much, Andy, for being with us. Andrew Lord is the head of quantum and optical, optical network research in BT. And he's our opening speaker today. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours, Andrew. Well, uh, incredible intro. I need to learn to use my arms like this, Poser. I, I just, um, I need some training from you. I've always told after conferences that I throw my arms around, but I'm not a patch on you. <laughs> so uh, I, I have a lot to learn. Very humbled. But thanks for the introduction. Um, six minutes. You'll be glad to know I've hit a timer on my other computer. So um, there's no way I can exceed um, six minutes. Um, so I just need to be able to go down the slide now. That's all. Um, 
just very quick, quickly about BT. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of BT, the, the big uh, carrier in the UK. Uh, just some facts here um, um, to absorb. But uh, what perhaps you don't realise how much research BT actually conducts. Uh, we spend a lot of money doing R&D. Um, we, we file a lot of patents every year. Uh, my team is responsible for, for some of those. Um, and we hire a lot of grads. Uh, and we have a very, very close collaboration with, with universities, not just around the UK, but around Europe. We need a lot of um, European and UK-based research projects. I've just completed one called Metro Hall with many uh, EU um, partners, which was highly successful. Um, what do I really want to say, though, this uh, this afternoon? Um, let's not underestimate the challenge. Um, many people might assume fibre is done. Well, it's really just getting going. Um, the big projects from um, the 20th century, you know, you can see there the pictures of them. Installing fiber to people's homes around Europe is the same scale, if not bigger, in the 21st century. Bigger because of the amount it's going to cost now. Everything costs more. Um, the amount of digging up of the ground. This is a huge investment and we can only do it once and we better get it right. And when we've done it, we better put things over it that work and that work for the next 100 years or more. So no pressure, guys, but the, um, the, the pressure on our industry to make this work is, is enormous. We better get the fiber right and we better get the technology that sits on it right as well. Um, and this is a slide everybody knows about. Massive um, global growth, growth in the UK. There's some real BT figures here that traffic is growing 30% every year, continues to do so. Uh, and 5G is currently the thing that's driving that. Um, but there's some problems, some major problems. Here's two. Firstly, electronics is running out of steam. Moore's law is not going to carry on forever. It's already starting to, to creak at the seams. Um, Shannon's law about putting a spectrum into optical fiber, spectrum into the C-band is already hitting a limit. It's kind of overtaken Moore's law in terms of depth. <laughs> um, what do we do? Do we open up new bands? Do we just put lots more fibers in? Um, what's, what's the solution to, to uh, Shannon's law? And really what I want to do just for two minutes um, is look at some of the uh, things that we're looking at at BT that I think that the industry should focus on to resolve some of these major crises that are coming at us just at the time when 5G started to take off. Um, firstly, we need to really capitalize on data center technologies. Data centers are where the growth is. That's where the volume is going to be thrown. That's where the cost is going to drop. So let's use that kit and let's find ways of bringing it into our network. How? Um, well, okay, um, data center technologies don't go as far, fair enough. Let's re-architect our network to find ways to bring them in because that's going to give us massive cost savings, okay? Um, we have to work around these reduced performance specs. Uh, that's that's the first thing. Secondly, and um, um, Jose has already talked about this, uh, photonic integration uh, is, is going to be absolutely key. I need to buy a photonic chip costing a few dollars, not not a box costing $10,000. $10, um, the only way to do that is to integrate. We're seeing a lot of uh, development there, but that development is only going to cost in once the volumes start to kick in. Um, thirdly, um, what do we do about the capacity? How do we put more capacity into our fiber? Well, actually, we have a kind of crossroads. We have some choices here. Um, do we just keep throwing Shannon at the C band and pile as much capacity to that as possible? I think that's running out. And it's getting more expensive to inch forwards. Do we open up the L band, the O band, and all of those bands and ask the vendors in the industry to do massive developments again, costing a fortune? A big ask for those guys. Um, is that what you want to do? Does, is that important for us to save the fibre that we have? Or should we just throw more fibre at the problem? Or what about new fibre types? Currently in my lab, we have hollow core fibre with some really exciting work going on. Um, and then finally, I think there's um, a big uh, attention towards re-architecting um, the core network, the access network, the metro network, making our central offices look more like data centers, uh, putting um, uh, resources like compute and storage there so that they don't have to travel across the core so we can save capacity that way. Um, and if you say, well, which of these is the big one? They all are, okay? We, there's no silver bullet. We have to work on all of these um, if we're gonna make a, a major impact to keep 
for the next five to 10 years, this, this 5G tsunami uh, going on. And I'm glad to say we're involved in research collaborations on all of these things, but we're very interested to talk to people that, that have ideas. Just very quickly there, you can see a picture at the bottom. I'm highlighting something called ZR Optics. Um, ZR is coming out of data centers. It does 400 gigs, but it doesn't go very far. What does that do to a core network when I plug a ZR Optics into a router? Okay, open question, but, but very interesting the impact that would have. And I want to thank you very much with 18 seconds to go, Jose. Thank you very much, Andrew. Very, very interesting presentation. So maybe can you go, come with, well, can you, um, let's go for what are your needs uh, here. So what kind of collaborations, what kind of technology challenges do you have uh, here for the company? From my side, it's seeing how um, these technologies, these base component technologies, can be integrated into something bigger. BT is never going to buy an optical component. I say never. Unlikely that we're going to buy a, a small component. What we buy is systems from system vendors. Um, the problem with that is it locks you in. Okay, so how do you get around this uh, lock-in question? Well, the, the solution to that has been discussed for several years, disaggregation. It's kind of not happened yet. Um, so we need to unlock the, the whole ecosystem so that innovation can be brought in much more quickly and from left and right and, and, more, and directions that we weren't expecting. That way, I think European uh, companies will have a much better way of having a role because they, they won't be frozen out. They'll be able to play because of the innovation that they're showing. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this uh, this answer. Uh, we have a we have a question uh, here from Fabio from Ericsson. Fabio, would you like to make the question by yourself? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, Fabio. How are you? Hi. Fine. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see so, you. My question is: uh, What is the main functionality you would like to get from integrated photonics? You, which is not still in place. <laughs> Oh, well, okay, very simply. I just want very cheap. <laughs> um, I, I, for the 5G uh, metro network, there's a lot of interest in optical switching uh, just to make sure we have flexibility, but not at a cost of a full-blown WSS Rodem. So if you can provide a, an optical integrated circuit that does okay at optical switching in terms of performance, but very, very well in terms of cost, I think that would be highly interesting. But obviously the main thing is pluggables, yeah? Uh, integration coming into uh, pluggables, which may eventually turn into a co-packaged router plus optical component where, where the optics and the router switching are all kind of integrated. Um, I, I think that's where we're headed. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this answer. Uh, now uh, we have more questions in the chat. Don Clark from Telecom Foresight Consulting. Do you want to make the question by yourself? Hello, Andrew. Long time no see. Hi. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So looking at these pluggables and data centers, very interesting technology, very high rate, small, uh, low cost, short, uh, short distance. You, you mentioned rearchitecting the network you know, in telecom to use those. What have you got in mind for that? At the moment, we run a, a core network that goes over big rodents, any to any, but by uh, to set up an any to any route, you have to kind of send wavelengths through these, these optical crossroads and route them around the network. Um, you can't do that for very high bit rates when the pluggables you're using don't go that far and data center pluggables don't, they're not designed to. So you might end up having to rip out those rodents and just do your uh, uh, connection between routers hop to hop. So instead of just going optically from one end of the country to the other, you go from router to router. That might sound expensive in terms of router uh, costs, but in the whole scheme of things, uh, if these pluggables, you know, which are the lion's share of the, op of the optical transmission costs are much cheaper, could be a route forwards. Oh, interesting, thanks. But, and, and just to add to that, if the router ports are now looking to be 400 and um, future 800 gigs, it's exactly the same as these ZR pluggables. So we, we have uniquely, I think, in the industry, an opportunity where the, the router is expecting the same line rate of, that the optics is ready for. You know, they've never been in sync before, but oh, somehow right. they've, they've synced up. So let, let's go for it. Oh, yeah, that's cool. I didn't thought about that. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And we still have another question. Uh, Stephen from Lightweight, uh, would you like to make the question by yourself? Uh, Stephen from Lightway. There we go. I'll even turn on my camera. Um, 
So you're mentioning the fact that, uh, you know, the next big fiber build, in, in essence, you got to get it right the first time because you're probably not going to repeat it. Having said that, you're interested in holocore and multi-core fibers and some of the research there. Do you see these new fibers being part of that big build or are these fibers likely going to be for niche applications? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we don't know. And that's why in the lab, we're currently running, I think, five parallel experiments on these things, all looking at different niche uh, applications. So for me, it feels unlikely that it's going to be quick enough to overtake you know the fiber to the home rollout i, I don't see it as, as, as a hollow core to everybody's home um, but that doesn't mean that it's niche does it it still mean you, you still have opportunities to connect uh, macro cells to get low latency to to do things like have um, your 5g cells further away because the latency means you know you, you can actually increase that distance um, so I, i'm not sure they're niche but they, they might not be a, a full-blown you know hundreds of millions of people rollout but, it, but they still could feature in, in the metro or the core part of the network without being something that just goes into a financial center for low latency. I, I, think, I think it's not necessarily ultra niche, but it won't be to everybody's home. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So then if there are no more questions or comments, I think we can move to our next speaker or well, it's better to say our previous speaker. So uh, Mark from Five Reality, if uh, not, we, we will share the, ah, okay, perfect. Very good. The floor is yours. Okay. Can you see my slides now? No, but this is not presentation mode. But it was first. In, maybe you have to switch the screen. Uh, this is your screen. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I see. Presentation mode. Cool. Okay, now you have to go to presentation mode. Click the thing. Yes. Can you see it now? I hope. <laughs> Great. I apologize. <laughs> uh, so as uh, my slide shows, we're going to have three areas of analysis here. Uh, going to look at the China slowdown, which uh, not, not, not hearing or reading much about, uh, but uh, there is a slowdown in terms of installations according to our intelligence. Uh, and uh, look at uh, how there's a stress on mature solutions as well as the, uh, the case study uh, of uh, advanced pick or, or pick advance, excuse me. Um, so if we go to the next one. And um, basically uh, what's going on with China is it's, it's, it's about Huawei. When, when it comes to the Chinese government funding uh, deployments, uh, it goes hand in hand with, with uh, Huawei's benefit. And uh, the fact of the matter is uh, there is this uh, supply chain issue with the chips that may be um, something that is dealt with with the new US administration. Uh, but even then, uh, there still might be uh, some uh, lag because of inventory and, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, when we're talking about 5G, uh, you know, it's about China, it's about Verizon, and everybody else is kind of you know, uh, at least a notch down. And so it's, I think it's important to know this since uh, it isn't being pointed out. This is a big part of the world, uh, uh, 5G optic space. Heck, uh, China is a big part of the optic space. Uh, they buy all these rotoms, the DWDM and that sort of thing. And uh, it's also about the fact that uh, uh, it's, uh, until we have millimeter wave in, in a more ubiquitous fashion, there isn't going to be as, as much of a need for, for optics uh, the way Verizon is deployed. In fact, the way Verizon is deployed it is, is unprecedented, where they've just done, done digging all over the country to put fiber in. And so, um, you know, that's going to have uh, you know, a big impact, uh, uh, you know, in terms of how uh, pervasive uh, or how extensive the millimeter wave is uh, in terms of enabling that and all that good stuff. So uh, yes, uh, despite uh, 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 you know a lot of emphasis uh, on, on new technology, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff is off the shelf. Very minor refinements. You know, Japan, uh, being China, for example, might look to squeeze a couple of wavelengths more out of what they have. Um, there's, there's limited differentiation. Uh, it's, it's possible that uh, some of these new pick designs may eventually, eventually occur uh, in order to get uh, maybe an order of magnitude, magnitude decline in costs. 
that 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 all remains to be seen. Um, I'm not too optimistic in the short to medium terms of that, of that happening. Again, I, I just see the mature off the shelf stuff really happening um, in, in a big way indefinitely. Uh, and um, on, on the last couple of points, uh, it's interesting. Verizon is considering 400 CR for, for for the mid haul. It's also possible for a brownfield application. It might look at 100 CR. Verizon's not too crazy about the, the 400 CR plus because it's not really standard space. Then you won't have the kinds of price declines that are being anticipated. So I do want to look at pick advanced, and uh, you know I, I don't play favorites, but uh, uh, I'm really surprised that this is getting more play in Europe. Uh, I mean, this this is an extraordinary achievement where uh, uh, you know basically uh, a company is getting uh, uh, from a Verizon Ventures funding, and uh, and I, you know I would say you know they they're an example if you're if you're if you're a startup chip vendor, it's 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 an example for Europeans to follow. And I think the uh, the current way of doing things, uh, which has been done a while for Europe, just isn't working. And uh, I don't want to mention the definition of insanity or anything or you know anything like that. But uh, but it's just the mindset is we have to leapfrog, and uh, it goes hand in hand with, with the government funding because you're not going to get as much government funding if you're not doing something like quantum, which you know cannot be projected right now. And no offense to the upcoming speaker. Uh, but, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not crazy about that uh, new uh, concept that's being floated of, uh, of a quick, <laughs> uh, not, not, it's not as an adjective. Uh, in, in, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mind Epic as, as a member getting into, into quantum, but uh, uh, we don't want to dilute uh, what's, what's happening on the optical side in general. And uh, Europe has a ways to go and um, I'm doing whatever I can as, as an American to make, you know, uh, to help Europe get back to where it is. But, you know, th this way of doing things hasn't worked. A lot of money is being spent. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think there has to be another way. That, that's not to say, you know, Pick Advance has taken advantage, of course, of government funds, uh, uh, whether it's EU funds indirectly or directly. Uh, they, they, they've partnered with a university, which get, gets government funds. I, I get all that. But I think we're talking about some, 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 something different here. And... Um, and it's really about the fact that, uh, you know, it, it, there's no way in heck that <laughs> Europe would have ever put together a private public or public private partnership based on entry pond two. It's just, it, it's just too small, be viewed as too small of an opportunity. Uh, but, but really it is attractive because of the limited attention. Uh, and it's attractive because it's evolutionary instead of revolutionary. And it's, you have Verizon, uh, arguably the most innovative operator in the world, uh, the most innovative long haul provider. Uh, they pulled off FiOS, which was really about fiber to business, but that's for another day. Uh, you know, and and you have Calix uh, with with Carl, who's one of the best CEOs in the business. And uh, you know, I, I, I kind of get it. Uh, access is really hard. Uh, it's really hard to make money on. And now we're talking about a subset of access, but. But uh, you know, uh, Pick Advance uh, was able was able to pull it off, and uh, I think again, this is an example. It's not to say that Pick Advance ha they have challenges ahead. They have a Canadian company, uh, Aponix, uh, on their heels, which seems pretty solid. Uh, and their CEO, uh, another thing that maybe European vendors and startups, chip chip startups, that kind of thing, should keep in mind going forward, is that. Uh, 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 the, the philosophy that, you know, maybe you just pick one thing to do, you know, not, not, not five, and you look for high volume because when you don't get the high volume and the cash flow going, then, then the nature of the platform is, real, is really irrelevant. So I think my time is about up anyway. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm ready for any questions. Thank you very much, Mark. And I was saying to everyone in the chat that you can consider this a teaser or the fantastic market report that will be distributed to the Epic members very soon. Mark, very thank you very much for working on that. We have been talking to Ipronics, Smart Photonics, from Hofer HHI, Peak Advance, and Lionics. And with this, we have collected the interest, and now you're working on answering these questions. One of these questions may be in the chat right now, because Jim Theodoras has something on his mind. Jim, what's on your mind? 
Well, I guess I'm a little panicked after I heard the last two speakers talking about new fiber plants, new technology needed for 5G. I guess I have the question, can 5G be viable with today's technology or is it a money loser until technology catches up and makes it viable? I mean, I guess which came first, the chicken or the egg? Do we, do we have to have new technology for 5G to be ubiquitous and, and, and viable? Or, or is this just kind of a placeholder waiting for everyone to, to it just the two speakers have me a bit um, flustered, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I, I think one of the reasons why people are flustered is they don't really understand what 5G is really about. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean that personally. <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, it's really about, uh, and Verizon gets a lot of uh, a flack for doing all this uh, millimeter wave. And I get it, you know, you know it's, it's limited. I mean, it bounces off a of glass. You, you, it doesn't have a lot of distance and it's problematic from an app standpoint. I, I would argue that millimeter wave is about providing a platform and uh, uh, an operations and internal operations platform to ensure adequate capacity for the subscriber base. In particular for Verizon, it seems like the ind industries have had some am amnesia. Uh, you know, early last year, uh, there was all this uh, talk about uh, uh, Verizon not having adequate spectral capacity. So it's, it's a, it, it comes, it's about survival, uh, providing enough capacity to, to the sub subscriber base and, and that sort of thing. So you're downlinking from, in the case of Verizon, uh, for uh, five uh, you know, uh, capacity uh, from the millimeter wave in the, in the central business districts of the major metropolitan areas. You're marrying that with DSS and carrier aggregation and uh, you're ensuring at least the minimum quality of service for all the subscribers. AT&T and T-Mobile, which is all of a sudden become this powerhouse, is not, won't, won't be in a position, or at least it is not in a position right now to say that. Verizon has made the investment, and uh, don't get me wrong, Verizon's made its share of mistakes in the past, but Verizon's, which made the investment in fiber, which uh, made the investment in the most efficient uh, 5G network that you can do, uh, it's gonna be positioned to provide uh, um, you know, capacity tools to its sub subscriber base. Thank you very much, Mark. I have to tell you, you know, in confidence, we are great friends. I have to tell you that in general, one of the diseases of Europe is that we keep seeing that the grass is always greener on the other side of the Atlantic. So that's, that really explains what you said about peak advance. Uh, I have a question in the chat from one of the people I look up to the most in this industry, a person who I can't stop saying congratulations to, Jose Capmani, beautiful comment in the chat. What's on your mind? Um, thank you, Jose. Uh, I was writing in the in the in the chat that for me, uh, five years it stands today is not really really uh, extremely exciting for optics other than uh, than transport, and this is because the frequencies so far are not extremely high. So why bothering uh, doing anything very special when you can actually uh, use probably use the, 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 the available technologies. In my opinion, what makes sense for, op, for photonics in 5G is uh, whenever this frequency rises up, goes into the 20s and 30s of gigahertz for the carriers. And, uh, and in, 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 in that moment, it would probably make sense to team up the, the broadband uh, um, uh, transport characteristics of photonics through fiber optic links uh, with the, um, let's say, more signal processing capabilities like beam steering, et cetera. So it was just a comment. Right. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a comment and a question. You both, Jose, yeah. and buenas tardes, Jose. Uh, buenas. Uh, Mark, would you like to comment on this? Are we going to use the higher frequencies, 30 gigahertz plus beyond transport in the short term? Yeah, I mean, uh, anyone who's a startup in this space, in particular, a uh, European chip startup or, uh, you know, some, somebody down on the food chain ought to be contacting Telstra yesterday because they're going to be very aggressive about doing mul mul uh, uh, millimeter wave. And that's going to mean a lot of optics. It may not necessarily mean new optics, but uh, at least you have a shot uh, in, in, have, in where there's a greater need uh, for, the, uh, for optical uh, networking to support uh, the, the uh, 5G. Uh, I, 
unfortunately, I think what's going to happen ultimately is, uh, uh, is of course, we'll have some apps, but I think it's going to be very difficult to get a return on investment when, when you do millimeter wave. And although I'm, I'm a free market kind of guy, I think we're going back to the future. We're going to, uh, there's only so much spectrum available. We're going to go back to having a utility mentality uh, where we'll have one 5G network that is government, uh, you know, controlled and funded, whatever, what, what, uh, however you want to look at it. And that's going to also facilitate the autonomous driving because you have a combination of uh, the government being involved with safety issues and that kind of thing, as well as internal controls uh, and, and that sort of thing within the car. So uh, unfortunately, that's where I see us going. Uh, and, uh, and, but it, it's, it's only a matter of time. I, I, it's not on the horizon for Europe, but it's only a matter of time before Europe does millimeter wave as well. Uh one more thing, Mark, we have a question for you from Stephen Hardy from Lightwave. Stephen, what's on your mind? Hey, Mark. Uh, hey, so good. you're uh, obviously, you know, Verizon is kind of the flagship uh, carrier for NG Pond 2. Do you see other carriers adopting the technology anytime soon? No, I mean, uh, I, I think the, the ones who have announced it, uh, maybe you could fresh my memory, Stephen. Uh, maybe Vodafone might have talked about it in Japan too. This is the past. I, I'm trying to remember. I mean, it's it's not it's uh, it's not being used widely. Uh, uh, but again, that might have been one of the reasons to select it. It, it uh, it's not where everybody was going, and I think Pick Advance was smart to do that. Now, maybe maybe it was just at the university they were just doing some experiments and. Uh, you know, doing a science fair kind of thing and say, well, you know, let's just do NG Pond 2. What does it matter what we do at a university? But the fact of the matter is you have this company within five years, within five years got money from Verizon Ventures. Uh, that's not to say it's going to be uh, all easy going forward, but that is an impressive achievement. That should be, that should be the story of the year. And that should be, and that should mean a total reevaluation of the way Europeans are funding uh, uh, optical programs and that sort of thing. Thank you very much, Mark. I really, really, really can't wait to see this. Well, I have already seen it. I really can't wait for the rest of people to see the report that you have been prepared and the kind of things that we have found out during this month, which has been really, really enlightening. I loved, I loved working with you every single minute of this conference course that we had was really fascinating for me. Today, we started with VT. And now we go to Adva and then Ericsson. Oh my God, to go to Adva and to go to Adva, we have to go to Jim. Jim Sao. Thank you, Jim, for being with us this beautiful afternoon in the Netherlands. We want to help Adva be even greater than already is. So the floor and the attention of everyone goes to you. Thanks, Jose. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's, I'm really thrilled to present here. Actually, this is my first time presentation at Epic. Usually I go to the conferences or technical conferences, but um, such a uh, event that's that's the first of kind uh, to me. Um, so uh, by the way, so my, my name is Jim Zhou and um, I'm working for Adva Advanced Technology for, for the research projects, but I also um, I'm part, part of the product line management for the future or next gen product uh, definition. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna talk about this kind of uh, new optical transport um, and options or technologies um, to really facilitate and boost uh, the 5G uh, access or 5G uh, radio network. Um, so I think this slide well uh, covers some previous uh, arguments or discussion among the other attendees or, or presenters. So apparently we, we got into this argument. So how, how important will optics be for, for 5G? Does it really need a fiber connection or different kinds of advanced uh, optical technology? So apparently if we look at the current <clears throat> connections between the antenna and the baseband unit or any central location of the of the RAN network, you got not only fiber, but dominant parts or technology is the microwave, which Andrew already mentioned, and also still some legacy copper there. 
So if we look at the, uh, the outlook from this, is the latest outlook uh, from Ericsson for the radio connectivity. So still right now, up to now, their majority of connectivity is provided by microwave. Of course, if you take the shear from the Northeast Asia, basically China or Co South Korea, Japan, then you got a large portion of uh, fiber connectivity already. But still the, the trend, as you can see that the fiber is getting more and more important and the dominant in this connectivity between the antenna and the base unit and also the advantages i think everyone's very clear about that so um, low loss large capacity and also this kind of immunity to or immune to any kind of uh, distortion or electromagnetic interference or weather conditions usually destroys the the microwave or the wireless backhaul but then um, to look at, um, let's say, the, the, the options. So we, we actually, from the optical community, uh, speaking of the fiber connectivity, we don't lack options on the table, but there's no silver bullet. So which one fits well, it, there's hard to say. So for example, I think cost is the king in this domain, in the access domain, including the, the mobile RAN. So uh, the TDM uh, naturally, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the TDM pound naturally comes in mind just because of the lowest the cost. And also it's proven to be a very mature and economic way to deliver the access network. So people are uh, kind of tend to think about if we can leverage this kind of uh, PAL network to deliver uh, the mobile RAN or this kind of any kinds of uh, mobile X hall. But the problem, of course, it based on the best effort traffic, and also it has some certain disadvantage um, uh, next to the cost advantage. But then the majority in the fiber connectivity for the RAN, of course, is the point-to-point -point fiber connectivity, so the gray uh, optics, so to say. So this gives the, the best latency and also probably the lowest the cost on the optical module. But the downside is that you have to deploy fiber like crazy so that's also why like uh, bt or even verizon invest a lot or even talking about new fiber deployment so that was one of the course then also we could also leverage something exists in the optical communication for for decades so the wdm so the wdm used to to be thought very expensive premium but we got this in position also already just to reduce um, and the, the cost and also the complexity to fit into this uh, mobile transport domain. So for instance, um, like Atfas, um, uh, we uh, offers this uh, GDOM Metro solution um, uh, years ago and officially launched uh, last March at OFC. So this was actually the code name, GDOM Metro was the code name of an um, uh, ITUT question six uh, study group 15 recommendation. And officially right now it's called uh, G.698.4 uh, recommendation. So uh, we leverage um, our standard contributions to, to quite a large extent to offer uh, a kind of uh, cost effective and WDM turnkey solution to, to help uh, mobile and enterprise networks um, uh, boost the capacity while at the same time saving the vital fiber resource um, thanks to the WDM, uh, let's say wavelengths, uh, WDM multiplexing. So, and, and the one of the highlight here is really this kind of uh, uh, enhanced and a smart um, and optical transceiver because this transceiver is not only tunable, but also it has this kind of auto tuning feature to ease really this kind of uh, service provisioning for this particular use case because you don't want your site engineer to really figure out which wavelengths to tune or which field reports to, to, to be connected. You want to just pop in the, the, the transceiver and it works automatically just without any human interference. So that's the, the whole idea of this kind of um, uh, auto-tuning or self-tuning transceiver, DWDM transceiver to be used in, in this kind of application. Of course, on top of that, we also introduce a different uh, field configuration for different network top topology and also some monitoring feature. But then also speaking of the transceiver, um, uh, we also know like the different uh, evolution of this kind of form factor. So right now we have this pluggable, including the 400 ZR for the next gen, a coherent pluggable, but there's also a trend also to introduce this kind of uh, onboard optics to further integrate the, the optic components together with the electric, uh, electrical component. And this is also what uh, uh, Kobo uh, is working on and also standardizing. <laughs> And um, I heard some 
junior researcher want to chime in. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so the, the last one I will also want to point out is also the synchronization because um, uh, to a large extent, as people tend to ignore or just try to overlook the, the importance of synchronization, especially through the, the, the transport network. So for instance, right now we have dedicated GNS connection to offer the timing information, but to the 5G, especially to too many drawbacks of the GPS connectivity, we want to transport in the, the integrity or keep the integrity of the synchronization information throughout the, our entire network. So this is also something we can leverage from uh, the optical domain and also using a lot of existing optical technology, like this case, a overlay of the, the timing uh, and transport um, over a, a WDM system. So this is just my few takeaways, and uh, which I didn't mention is also this uh, this aggregation the openness in, uh, openness in the RAN that uh, uh, Andrew also mentioned before, um, and also a kind of a know-how from application protocol to transport layer. So you have a whole stack of uh, uh, transport uh, uh, options to really enable your mobile RAN uh, transports. With that, I would like to thank for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, for this presentation. And now, I mean, the usual question, uh, what are the challenges that you can see in your, in your developments and that uh, these companies in the room will help you with? Yeah, I think it's very simple. It's just cost. <laughs> Any kind of uh, technology could reduce the cost and also the, especially not the cost of um, let's say uh, the investments, uh, the, the, the KPEX, but also the, the, the OPEX. So this is really critical for this kind of access network. Um, that's also the reason there's a certain kind of uh, reluctance and also a certain of, uh, kind of pushback, how we are going to really leverage all these kind of optical uh, technologies or, or, or solutions. And uh, on the other side, I think openness is really the key because I think 5G is, is nothing like the previous Gs. Um, so the, the transport part is really the next innovation to the radio technology because in the previous Gs, people were just talking about fancy radio technologies increasing the, the capacity through the wireless channel. But right now in 5G, a lot of passion and also a lot of benefit really to, to drive the, let's say, the revenue and also the profitability is from the transport part. But traditionally, this is kind of a locking uh, between the wireless uh, uh, equipment. So how can we fit in the transport part with a kind of a ecosystem? I think this is what we are looking at. Thank you, Jim. And in order to reduce the cost of uh, the devices, have you been thinking in photonic integration in the use of uh, photonic integrated circuits? For sure. I mean, the cost is really depends on the yields and also the power consumption, the small footprint. I think everyone knows about that. But also the other thing we should also kind of, um, uh, let's say, keep in mind is that we got so many different flavors on the table. Again, also on the, the pick on, on, on the component level. So everyone please believes that the volume will drive down the cost, but which one will just get in the position or get out of the, uh, let's say, uh, the candidate. So um, that's that's something uh, we also need to monitor and also follow up, I think. Maybe it's a good moment uh, now for the foundries that are in the room, uh, such as uh, Ligentech, uh, Michael, hello. Yes, hello, hello. Um, Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, would you like to explain what is uh, Ligentech and maybe you can comment uh, uh, about um, what Jim is saying about reducing the cost uh, using photonic integrated circuits? Yes, so so, so Ligentech, we are um, uh, a manufacturing partner for, for low loss integrated uh, photonics. We're focusing on, on silicon nitride. Uh, so we have a, a, very, a very good platform for low loss uh, propagation. And especially for um, for um, WDM and and uh, wavelength uh, max and and Dmax, uh, there is uh, there is advantages that you that you have with uh, with silicon nitride, as you also have very uh, the dn over dt the, the 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 temperature stability is much better than than in other um, integrated circuit platforms. 
And uh, in terms of uh, in terms of costs, I I agree with with what was mentioned before. It it all depends on scaling. So so if there is enough enough scaling potential there, then yes, the cost uh, can go down. However, what we also need to to look at is what costs not only do we have on the on the pick itself, but um, likely we need. We need several picks, and we need to, to to integrate them, and we need to couple them to fibers, and we need to to use lenses or or other other ways to do that. So it's not only the cost of the pick; it's also the cost of the of the package itself. And yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. And also, I know we have uh, people from Effect Photonics in the room. Uh, Just or, or Sergi, would you like to comment now about the um, about the considerations about photonic integration in, in transceivers. Okay. Yes, I can. Ah, hello. Hi, Anna. Very good. good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry, I, I just joined recently. So um, uh, was there a specific question that you wanted me to answer or? Just well, we were we were talking with him from Adva about uh, reducing the cost, no? For I am a huge fan here, so I cannot stay quiet. Sorry, Anna. Sorry, Anna. <laughs> look, no, no, no. look, just no. right now we have Adva Jim Su. He tells us, "I heard that there are companies developing self-tuning approaches for photonic integrated circuit-based transceivers." And with that in mind, uh, I couldn't avoid looking at Eindhoven because you have really, really been one of the pioneers of bringing the self-tuning capability to the peak-based transceivers. So just from effect photonics, can you give us a few teasers of why and what is effect doing on the self-tunability? Yeah, sure. So um, obviously um, at effect photonics, we, we integrate all of the optical elements onto a single chip. So that that already makes it quite quite cost effective, especially for SFPs, that's, that's important, but also later when we move to more complex uh, optical transceivers. And then adding the, the self-tunability on top really makes it a, 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 yeah, a very good replacement part that's easy to replace. And what we're really trying to do is uh, to also uh, quite aggressively go into the market and uh, try to challenge even fixed wavelength devices. Because with this auto-tune uh, capability, it makes it, uh, you just plug and play, right? So there's not a, there's no longer a need for uh, complicated configuration in the field or uh, like uh, special training for tunable devices. So it makes these tunable devices feel and, and operate almost like fixed uh, wavelength devices. And then because we have the, uh, the cost reduction of uh, having everything on a single chip, there's really a, a nice aggressive approach that we can do into the market there. So I think that's those two things combine very well together. Jose, Jose, you are mute. Yeah, I had to be muted. It's the sentence of the year. Uh, thank you very much, Jost. I will be coming back to you. And of course, I'm happy to make the introductions. But I'm going back to Jim. Jim, we are talking a lot about costs. And people who know me know that this actually itches. When we talk about costs, I don't like talking about costs. Uh, for many of the, of the architectures here, we are bringing photonic integrated circuits to base stations. To base stations, some of them you put them at the top of the mountain with our sound device now very hard to reach places. Isn't low maintenance, low maintenance and reliability far more important than saving a few hundred euros? Uh, by the way, to which gym? We got two gyms online. Gym I think so. we need. Gym yeah, so I think we need a MIMO. We need a MIMO technology here. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. As I said, I mean, uh, this is exactly uh, what I mean for uh, the um, uh, OPEX, um, because this is a very unique operation environment than a traditional DWDM system. So you have a very a kind of a harsh environment and also a, a, an uncontrolled um, deploy uh, scenario, which you cannot easily access like the traditional telecom uh, facility. So that's exactly the reason that we really want to um, kind of uh, promote and also kind of uh, push this kind of auto tuning feature and also this kind of uh, capability in, on top of a traditional no DWDM system. So that really tailored, that's really tailored for this kind of mobile transport application. 
Jim, this show is filmed live, of course. We are all live here. I just have to say that I just received the application form for Epic membership from Infinera. So mm. thank you very much, Harald Bock from Germany. Thank you very much for joining Epic. Uh, Jim, all these companies who are developing technologies, photonic integrated circuits for self tunability how can we work together? Is there a way to make some kind of collaboration to test, to test these modules into the equipment of ADVA? For sure. I mean, this is what we exactly we are excited to, to see and also to kind of welcome because, I mean, we already got a, a nice reference and also kind of a, um, a, code, a stone in place. So which is this uh, G.Metro Metro spec, or I would just rather say uh, G.698.4. Uh, I mean, this is a little bit long. So this is already consented and also kind of uh, a place and also even revised in, 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 in the face and at the um, uh, ITUT. So the, the spec really defines all the interfaces and also requirements. So if um, that that's really drives the, the, the entire effort and also the collaboration to really implement and also realize um, this, this kind of fascinating technology. Uh, Anna is working very strongly on bringing something called PixUp, which is a set of design rules for the assembly of photonic integrated circuits for the key applications, the design rules, and of course, the volume production. Uh, is there a way to get some input from Adva to define some, some of the potential interfaces? Because I want the devices from Effect, from Ligentech, from Infinera to be part of Adva equipment. Anna, how can we work on this? How can we get the right information from ADVA to make sure that all these photonic integrated circuit manufacturers make a possibility of a collaboration with them? Well, we have been working with ADVA before, so yes, I think we can go for it. Fantastic. Okay. Simplicity. And now I will go, we move to con continue with the program. Thank you very much. And I think nobody can defeat the fantastic slide from Andrew Lord, defeating death. I loved it. We continue with the program and we talk now from... Ericsson. This is BT, Alba, Ericsson, back to back looking for partnerships. And we have one of the, my favorite people at Ericsson because he's a quantum guy like me, Fabio Cavaliere. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor and the attention of everyone. I love quantum technology. I can't hide it. Goes to you, Fabio. Thank you for your uh, nice introduction. I'm really an optical expert. Just join quantum later in my life, but <laughs> that's good. So just try to share in my screen now. So, uh, okay. So, uh, see it After this presentation, I'm going to give the floor to Tracy Vanik, who has something quite fantastic to show us. He found, he did some findings on the importance of timing in optical networks. So, after the presentation from I'm trying to share. Fabio, okay. who is Managing to share? Yes, he's, he's managed. Okay. Yes, Fabio, the floor and the attention of everyone okay. goes to Ericsson. Okay, Crystal thank clear. you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, this is the... Let me go to the first slide. Then. Okay, so this is the just a picture, an overview of the optical component market. It is a healthy market, uh, more or less divided in equal shares between uh, telecom and datacom. Datacom with uh, moderate volumes at higher cost and datacom with higher volume, lower cost. But in terms of revenue, more or less they are equivalent. Uh, but it is also a fragmented market. You see that uh, uh, also the uh, biggest vendor of optical components, vendor one is a quite a small share of the overall market. So this means that uh, it is a very competitive market, uh, which foster innovation somehow, but also poses profitability challenges. Okay. And uh, so where does 5G fit in this market? Let just me uh, record the concept of the mobile transport network. Uh, we started talking about mobile transport network with 5G. And uh, as a new transport network segment with its own peculiarities, and uh, you can see the picture is taken by one of the recent IQT recommendations that uh, uh, illustrate a few scenarios in, in those frameworks. So uh, the distances are, are short, as in access network. 
the capacity and is high and the multiple topologies need to be supported as in wide area network regular transport network and there is a the need of new advanced features like the self configurability self tuning uh, introduced by other speaker before for instance and also low latency transmission and switching in this area and this poses several challenges for optical components because uh, uh, it is true that the potential for the volumes are high but it's also true that uh, the target cost is low as in access but on the other end, the, the features that we are requiring to this kind of devices are very demanding as in one. So this is not uh, an easy deal, I would say. In summary, 5G requires an optical component for this segment, and there are business opportunities, but the initial investment and risks are big too. And uh, we think that uh, in this case, standardization multi-source agreement, pilot lines for prototyping, also public co-funding at the early stage of the development are possible to, to mitigate this risk. Uh, I will not go into the detail of these slides, it's just uh, listing some components uh, uh, to show that uh, we have in mind that some concrete things, this is not just theoretical talking, but there are features that need to fulfill in this new transport segment. And then, uh, in summary, uh, there are many uh, challenges due to this on the integrated photonic ecosystem. Because integrated photonics is a TNF technology for all those new development, but uh, there are some issues to overcome. Uh, for instance, for LD prototypes, multi project weather are ideal, but are not for product or engineered prototype. Uh, there is lack of widely accepted standard design libraries uh, as they exist for uh, electrical integrated circuits. Uh, and current silicon fabs are reluctant to divert resources on products that have much lower volume than consumer market, for instance, uh, chips in a uh, smartphone, which is their cash flow, their cash cow, sorry. And uh, uh, there are skills such as co-packaging with the speed uh, electrical AC, for instance, 200 gigabit per second, 100 gigabit per second, and integration with the uh, active 3 5 component in silicon that are not so common yet. So, and the last but not the least, and perhaps the most important point, uh, there are several business development models. Some of them are uh, illustrated in these slides. And the choosing one is not obvious and depends on the specific component you would like to develop. So let me conclude this talk with a hope. In Europe, there is a unique know-how, I know this for experience, that could lead to significant industrial impact, but probably more critical mass, more coordination is needed, a resource sharing and know-how sharing I would like, among the various initiatives. So thank you. This concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great presentation about the integrated photonics ecosystem challenges. I love, I, very, I really love this slide and there is a lot to cover here. What I really would like to ask you most important here, Fabio, this is your first ever epic meeting, of course. And I have something we call the epic question. And the epic question is basically what can you do for the 660 members of epic and what can they do for Ericsson? So do you have a particular one or two challenges that the companies here who who do the whole value chain from materials to micro optics to integrated photonics to packaging to integration in equipment? What can they do for you? Just one or two challenges. Okay. Uh, there, there, there are many things, of course. One is a generic wish, as a like, or <laughs> a generic is to help us with this ecosystem. So uh, it will uh, somehow make uh, the whole value chain from. Uh, um, the study with university to first design the prototype uh, alpha sample and so on sustainable for us because they, they, uh, they trade off between risks and, <laughs> and so and uh, uh, and the uh, potential business is not uh, obvious especially at uh, first TRL stages and uh, the second one is uh, more technical if you like there are uh, some uh, very well established 
uh, lines for integrated photonics, for instance, uh, uh, integrated transceivers. Nobody questioned this. But there are new applications, for instance, uh, optical switches uh, or uh, recomputable drop multiplexer that uh, Andrew was mentioning uh, before. This will be really uh, new enablers for this uh, 5G transport space, could really revolution that segment of the network and uh, uh, helping us in, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, finding new players in this area will be, of course, one of our <laughs> wish. <laughs> In your in your slides, you were really good. I'm going to put it back because I just love this. It was a fantastic slide. In your slide, you were talking here about the about the integration between high electrical high high speed electronic ICs and yes, the, 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 uh, and, the, and the indium phosphide photonic integrated circuits. Yeah. Um, we have developed in EPIC a huge community on the missing ingredient between the electronic ICs and the integrated photonics, which is the micro optics and the wafer level, the wafer level optics that are actually manufactured in many, many of the key companies in Europe. Today, we have two of them in the room. Uh, is there any approach, any preferable uh, solution for this? Are you fully doing co-packaging or examining another alternative for the integration of electronic ICs? Uh, we are uh, um, investigating this and uh, I mean serious investigating. So <laughs> we are evaluating uh, uh, what is more applicable to our base station at the end. Okay, uh, don't worry because I know that there is very little uh, that you want to say about yeah, this. Yeah. I know that, but I know people who so, want to work with you on this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go now, Fabio, to the micro optics companies and see how they feel if they have enough information to provide a solution for you. I'm going to go okay, first, to, <laughs> first to SUS micro optics. Uh, Wilfred Noel, do you have some comments for Fabio from Ericsson? So yes, always was very impressive. I, and I fully agree. There's no standard for PICS yet. And the foundries are reluctant to do certain technologies. They're, they're, this is very true. So we, we don't see a trend for, for uh, uh, there. And um, <clears throat> I mean, of course, there's a lot of pick already out there. It's deployed heavily by, by certain players who have the, the cash and the big pockets. They, they, they are able to put pick everywhere. And um, so there's, but this is never wafer level optics. This is still component optics. The problem is with the pick, if you do it on wafer level, it takes a lot of real estate. So the, you don't need much, uh, you don't need much optics for, uh, for pick. Uh, uh, if you look on the real estate per wafer. So it will, we would lose a lot of empty space um, if you go to wafer level, but nevertheless, we could do it. We're actually already looking with certain companies into this. So it is going on, um, but it's in the very early stage, but we would be happy to work with Ericsson and, uh, and, and look at opportunities there and to, to integrate our, our wafer level optics uh, uh, to, uh, into the pick market, huh? so we uh, we would love to do this. Huh? No problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, another company that is uh, really in the edge of technology when it comes to the wafer level assembly of the integrated photonics and micro optics is Icon Photonics. I think he's looking at me and he knew I was going to come to him. Uh, we have uh, interacted with Icon Photonics, introducing you to many players, and we got great feedback of the introductions. Uh, you heard from Fabio, they are looking for a, they are looking for partners in general of the integration of integrated photonics for their new developments. What does Icon Photonics do for the packaging of integrated photonics with micro optics? Hi, Jose. Uh, hi, Fabio. Very nice uh, slides uh, also. So um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for uh, introduction. It, it's true that uh, at uh, Icon Photonics, we are, we are providing wafer level solutions uh, for coupling and uh, packaging issues. And uh, I would just say that uh, the, the specialty is that we, we do that uh, custom made solution. So um, that's why I, I would be very interesting to, uh, in the, to, to discuss with you, uh, Fabio, uh, later. And uh, so, yes, so we, we provide the solutions with a, a film polymer layer that we, we are able to manufacture in a 3D, 3D shape and uh, to give different shapes that uh, solve different issues at, uh, at a wafer level. So it could be interesting also. There's many people, Fabio, who want to have the, the, the technical discussion with you. And I think your entry point was great. But I have companies like, like Accetris, like Limo, like MicroR here that could really be... Actually, I'm going to go to John Yost because you're going to be... Fabio, you're going to love what these guys do. John, 
what do you see in the presentation of Fabio that ring a bell and what does micro R do, do in, the, in the business of high speed of electronic devices for Datacom? Sure, thanks Jose. It's nice to, it's a very nice presentation. So yeah, so I'm John Joes from micro R. Our, our specialty is both narrow line with lasers as well as optical frequency comb sources. So this is uh, perhaps, you know, in telecom, I see that there's, uh, everyone's using single channels or single channels are auto-tuned, but perhaps a different way to do things is to have many precision channels all at the same time. And this is where there's several new technologies and companies out, coming out, such as micro R. So I think this is another way to provide mini lasers in a small, small package. So I think it's another way to fulfill the needs and the bandwidth needs as things shrink down, you need more and more lasers. And it's a compact way to do it. The frequency comm market uh, is, is increasing. I'm really happy to see the, the companies like Micro R and like Pilot Photon is receiving lots of interest from the network. Uh, good news for you, John. And also for you, Fabio. Tracy Vanik has been investigating a lot the 5G market over the last month, and she has some interesting findings on the timing for the 5G network. Tracy, you have something to show us, right? I, I think that you have something of mine to show. Yes. <laughs> So first, first introduce yourself. Tell us who you are because it's your first ever at, uh, appearance as an Epic employee. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jose. I'm Tracy Vanek. Uh, I'm new with Epic. I've been here since the 4th of January and I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, my background has been a, a wide range of different markets, uh, different applications uh, from the initial, let's uh, uh, change from SDH and Sonnet to 10G, 10GE and indium phosphide to looking at, at uh, solutions for Wi-Fi as well as more recently cybersecurity implementations. But right now I'm back to photonics. And one of the things that I found in looking at, at 5G was that there's a problem that is very quietly mentioned and that's that 5G is losing sync. And so with that, there are some new things that are coming out for, for 5G that will actually have some very beneficial results for photonics. So uh, what we see on this diagram is we see a new architecture that's emerging. Uh, so you, you have moved from having GNSS at each base station to having a central uh, antenna that will be part of a, a cesium clock system to create a centralized timing system and sync for the rest of the network. And what is interesting here is that these sync issues are impacting not just one section of the network, but the entire network. And in order to provide uh, accurate synchronization, we need this now. So some of the providers have already started to develop their, their uh, timing network, and others are in the process of doing so. But this is in order to meet the Titan 5G requirements uh, for now, as well as what is going to be necessary as 5G evolves and as we come up to 6G. So, but in order to do this, there are some widespread, widespread changes that must occur within the network infrastructure. From the core timing network all the way back to the, the antennas going through the, the back hall, the mid hall, the front hall, um, all the way through to the base stations, we have to make sure that this entire network is synchronized for the best possible uh, uh, spectrum utilization so that we can actually deliver high bandwidth and high speed services and support time sensitive uh, implementations such as real time autonomous vehicle information that can provide um, traffic condition uh, information to vehicles as they're driving. There's an accident right over the hill that you can't see. For timing systems, for uh, industrial control systems that require very tight timing in order to have the maximum possible yields. Uh, we have to have very tight timing within 5G, very tight synchronization in order to support these. Thank you very much. It's a huge finding. I don't know if you, all of you saw the final bullet point on the slide, talking about the replacement of the existing switches and routers uh, that, of course, there is a lot to discuss there, but I want to see uh, the reaction that we got. Oh, wow, we got some reaction here from Alex. Stop us from UOP. What's on your mind? Well, my, my question is whether uh, this synchronization is something that networks have um, addressed uh, 25 years ago with SDH. I mean, uh, I, I'm teaching that material to undergraduate students, and uh, the question is how do you achieve um, synchronization at pit level? Uh, 
uh, and there are a whole mechanism in SDH for doing this. So, uh, what's happening now? The mobile networks to discover the need for synchronization. Well, what had happened was that with 4G and, and earlier, uh, they were using CIPRI, and CIPRI was TDM based, but now they're they're using eCIPRI, which is Ethernet based, and that has created a whole range of new issues. So as a result, eCIPRI does not provide sync, so it has to be uh, obtained from outside. And there are a number of different protocols that have been uh, developed for this. One common protocol is PTP, but not all PTP protocols are the same. And so there are new requirements from the ITU to make sure that we are going to be able to meet the sync required for 5G applications. So yes, we, we did it right before and then it kind of devolved a little bit and now we're getting it right again with these overlay uh, timing networks. And uh, now the meeting is getting hot. Jim yes. from Adva, uh, what's I'm on sorry, your but, mind? Uh, um, oh, you're sorry, Alex, tell yeah, me. Uh, um, in, uh, during uh, the SDH era, which is, uh, as I said, 25 years ago, and still on, uh, we have created a number of stratums for the accuracy of the clock. So it, it is, uh, uh, are we trying to reinvent the wheel now? I, I didn't get it. I mean, not us, the, the wireless people who pretend they're gonna save the world. Well, I think part of it, too, is not just the protocol CIPRI and eCIPRI, but it's also the GNSS, you know, where are you getting your, your clock from? And traditionally, we've had the GNSS systems that have been uh, at each base station. But as you're looking at over 8 million base stations, that becomes pretty cost prohibitive. So now this timing network, having a centralized timing network with a cesium clock uh, that will connect to GNSS, they only need to connect once because GNSS, that will give us the offset for the, the uh, cesium plots. And then we could theoretically run forever without having the connection to the GNSS. So the other uh, factor that has been pushing this has been GNSS are not reliable. They're uh, satellites. They're in an, an area that is very crowded up in space and they can go down. So this is the other thing that's, that's propelling this forward. Alex, thank you very much for that comment. And I think the right person to address this is Adva. I really, really can't wait to see what is the reaction after seeing this slide. Jim, how do you address the timing issues? And do you agree, agree with Tracy that we're going to replace every switch and router connecting base stations? Yeah, um, thanks for uh, just adding me in uh, and also happy to chime in. So I think uh, Tracy really raises a, a very interesting topic, uh, which I also mentioned at the end of my talk, but uh, because of lack of time, I couldn't expand that too much. But uh, indeed, this is synchronization, which was overlooked by a lot of people, especially during the transport. But uh, just to continue with Alex's question, I think one thing is different is that in the in the uh, the mobile transport synchronization, uh, apart from the frequency uh, synchronization, but also another very important is the the time of the day and also the phase. Uh, synchronization, especially the time of the day. So this is something the SDH or the Sync E cannot deliver. And the other thing is that um, like Sync E or SDH, so this is based on a kind of a hardware or layer one or zero uh, synchronization, synchronization technology. But um, the, the, the nice or this kind of neat uh, feature of um, PTP is that this could be transported together with your data plan. So this is something just to embed or encodes the, the timing information with your data plan or the data transport. So this is very unique and also very attractive for different uh, uh, transport equipments. And then the, the rest of the need, the, let's say the needing of this kind of uh, transport of synchronization through the network is exactly what Tracy um, um, pointed out because of the vulnerability of your GNS uh, as signal and also a very cost uh, kind of um, uh, overhead to deploy so many and GPS antennas into different uh, micro cells or even uh, small cells. And also what is different from the previous uh, generation is that, uh, let's say generation of the radio technology is that a lot of 5G will be deployed indoor, which theoretically you cannot not get any GNS signal from the, the satellites. So that's also drives the needs of this kind of synchronization and, and transport it through the network. Thank you very much, Jim. I anticipate a really, really bright future for self-tuning and also for mode lock lasers, and especially, especially for technologies that keep the timing. I have a, a comment. I have a comment from Rohin from Lightspeed AI Labs. Rohin, 
Thank you very much for being at the meeting today. What's on your mind? Uh, uh, hello, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, calling me out. Uh, I have a slide that uh, Nokia uh, talks about uh, in, in 5G so data center evolution, life at the edge. Uh, if you don't mind, I can just share it right away. Of course, um, don't worry, they are in the room. They are watching us. <laughs> so uh, this is one thing that uh, kind of, uh, uh, is stuck in my mind when, when people talk about 5G where uh, the number of racks that are uh, closer to the edge, uh, this is, although despite being smaller, this acts as an intelligent switch. And, and, and uh, this intelligent switch is something that is only possible with uh, an, an FPGA kind of uh, 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 hardware where uh, all this uh, data flow from the photonics can be uh, cleverly processed uh, uh, pretty much with the high data throughput. So that's one of the things that we are working on in system and package integration of uh, FPGAs with uh, high-speed optical interconnects. So this is something that we take as an inspiration. I don't know if this is in line with the discussion, but uh, I thought this is the right time to bring it up. It is totally the right time. And one thing that we keep not talking too much is about in my opinion, the testing of the optical networks in terms of latency. And later at the end of the presentation, we're going to have a presentation from Expo. And after that presentation, I'm going to address it again because we are really looking for partners of that. So Expo, you're going to be talking at the end. Be prepared for this. And before that, we are reaching now, in my opinion, the tip of the mountain of the meeting. We go to the company that all of us are looking at as success case, as a future gazelle. We go to Portugal and we go to Peak Advance. I can't hide, I'm a huge fan of what these people are actually achieving. Thank you very much for being with us today. And tell us, tell us what you're doing and most important, how we can help you being even better than you're already becoming. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Peak Advance. Francisco, we have you muted. I'm going to print t-shirts with the Epic logo. You are muted. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. It looks like it's the first time or something. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you and see now we go screen? to presentation mode. Let's go. Let's do it. Time is counting and you will not forgive me. Time is important today. Uh, you will not forgive me if I don't meet the six minutes target. So thank you very much for the, the invitation. It is great to, to, to be here with such a very good audience and uh, very, very nice discussions that uh, I'm learning a lot to them. So just a little bit of Peak Advanced, which uh, is a startup company founded in 2014 here in Portugal and uh, with a major focus for uh, NGPON2 and uh, the advantages of developing optics for uh, tunable applications, which is the need for the ONU side. Um, we also have the vision not only for, to develop NGPON2 optics, but also to develop uh, peak-based solutions for access, and not only, but access is where we are focusing uh, the most right now. So uh, we started in 2014, and now currently we are uh, around 30 people focused on the R&D to bring better uh, and more innovative solutions for access networks, and not only. So the access networks that everybody has been talking here, so... I will not spend too much time. Started with GPON, 1.25 gigabit per second, and then moving to 10G technologies. Now XGS PON, XG PON, and 10G E PON are uh, in wide deployment as well. And then uh, also standardized one as NG PON2, which was uh, multiple times discussed here today. So NG PON2 is a PON technology that has uh, time division multiplexing. Uh, as a bandwidth of 10 gigabit per second. And, and this uh, main advantage is wavelength division multiplexing as well. So designed to have between four to eight wavelengths, one can have in the pond topology the advantages and the fully advantages of uh, wavelength division multiplexing, which is uh, uh, very important for network maintenance, uh, bandwidth aggregation, uh, among and many other um, advantages that operators have in hands when they are studying the differences between the technologies. Peak Advanced focus on developing the ONU optics, uh, which uh, are now in the market and uh, are in production right now and have been for the past two years. And uh, we also think how can one take advantage of this 
marvelous uh, opportunity of ng.2 which is a high-end technology nobody can deny it it's a tunable technology and there are wavelengths that can be assigned to other applications and one application is 5g definitely how can one use the fiber infrastructure that is already there for uh, the the pawn that the operators have and take advantage of it for the new deployments for the 5g one option is to merge what we have already in our transceiver which is a layer one device the pluggable transceiver and merge it uh, with a no anti optical network terminal uh, main functions like layer one and layer two functionalities and uh, putting everything inside the pluggable which is called the stick the ng.2 stick so having uh, tunability and also the capability of layer two uh, inside a single transceiver that can go into the base station to the small cells for this meet all application that we have been discussed before uh, in the in the previous um, the previous speakers that said uh, that there is um, short distances medium uh, bandwidth which 10g can can offer the solution for that so uh, Definitely, ng -pon, the, this ng.2 stick is a 5G enabler. One can connect already existing infrastructure from a point to multi point technology and assign wavelength, connect the, the, the small cells and the base stations in this, for this mid all uh, applications and uh, the topology and enable it with just a SFP plus interface that is standardized. You just need to plug the stick and it's uh, directly activated as a CPE and think ahead and use the advantages of uh, this ng.2 bringing more than one wavelength. So this is also allow us to increase the bandwidth per port uh, and go up to 40 gigabit per second, 80 gigabit per second. How can we move from this stick that will be in the first place 10 gigabit per second and allow to start deployment all these networks and move to higher bandwidths. We have also discussed this as well today, uh, photonic integration, and we are taking part of it. So replacing these uh, more bulky optics that have their know-how inside into a uh, planar circuit, we are into monolithic integration. So we are using Unix Plus 5, and we have developed these uh, uh, several structures internally uh, of know-how, to help us bring these solutions from layout simulation, packaging and testing characterization. So definitely we do not do fabrication and we are looking forward to hear from the, the foundries that are here today also on how can we improve our designs, how can we cooperate to uh, help this go into market because definitely uh, this will help increase the bandwidth, this will help reduce the power consumption, but there is uh, a challenge because it's the motto of today. There is the challenge as well of um, making this into production. And photonic integration is all about this, bringing everything into a cost-effective production and uh, reduce the cost. So the first iterations we have done, we have put our peaks into uh, inside the transceivers. We have done the first testing and we are ramping up now our development. So we will be very exciting to soon um, present the, this ng.2 stick, the first generation that will be with discrete optics and then with the integrated ones. For those who want to learn more about Peak Advanced, just click on the link. It, this, I believe the slides will be available. And uh, once again, thank you very much for uh, the, 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 the invitation to be here today. Thank you very much, Francisco. Super nice, uh, super nice presentation. And now maybe you can tell us uh, how can how the, the the companies in the room can help you to be even better. No, uh, do you have any any challenge in the fabrication of the chips, uh, in the packaging, uh, whatever you can think? So definitely, there is. It is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we try to have in house knowledge for the R and D part. Um, which uh, so that's we defined our uh, architectures we defined our packaging uh, approach but we need scale and that is something that we are also learning how to bring it uh, internally and with other partners definitely fabrication in mass fabrication of complex uh, uh, architectures will uh, bring uh, the challenges that need straight cooperation with foundries and help to work uh, those problems in advance 
and think beforehand will allow us to have a, a more success and a shorter time to market because we really want to, to bring this into market as fast as possible. Very good. Thank you for this answer. And now, well, the chat is boiling with questions for you. Um, first Great. of all, I would like to I would like to give the word to Francois Menard uh, from iPhonics. Uh, Francois, I think you had a comment before, right? Oh, I I said the. Uh... No, no, no. You you were mute. Sorry. No, now you are mute again. Okay, no. so now I can be heard. Uh, the question was as follows. Um, One-way latency uh, for uh, 5G is important, especially uh, the packets coming from the cloud into the handset, uh, as this is the path that ultimately that delivers more data than the upstream, although you could say that upstream latency is also important because this is what is going to signal you hitting a deer or something uh, with your car. Uh, <clears throat> so the question becomes, uh, to which extent should we consider in the photonics community uh, use of the C and L bands as uh, the uh, right uh, frequencies for sending information over the O band, given that it has potentially much better latency than O band. And uh, we see this uh, featured in the NGPON2 standard, uh, but going forward after NGPON2, uh, there are, are many talks uh, to go in O-band uh, for mobile front hall. And I'm not necessarily sure that this is helping uh, the cause for reducing latency. Uh, and so the question is, uh, what are the views on the panelists as to the bare bones uh, choice of the right frequencies for uh, sending information for 5G front hall. Uh, if, if I may address, I think others uh, may speak better than me on this topic, but uh, uh, this is a matter of the, the topology that the operator wants to use. Uh, today we have heard uh, multiple technologies like DWDM. You can choose the, the wavelengths, typically they are from C to L but uh, one can also standardize other bands of operation, but definitely NG.2, uh, if, if you want to use uh, WDM and uh, TDM at the same time, NG.2 already offers the, the better, the, with the better trade-off, uh, the CNL bands, as you said, and very correctly pointed the, that out. Um, hey, thank you very much. Can I uh, comment uh, in addition? Yeah, I think it's 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 very uh, it's it's basically a trade off. I mean, if you go for longer wavelengths, first of all, if you go longer wavelengths, the dispersion will kill you immediately. Okay, so this this is why people kind of are stick or even for higher bandwidth uh, moving kind of uh, closer and closer to the old band. Although in old band you have other different disadvantage, higher loss or whatever cannot be amplified, etc. But again, this is a trade-off. This is the first thing. The other thing is that actually any kind of latency, even like this kind of uh, different bands, differential, uh, uh, let's say group delays, we are talking about really like sub microsecond or even nanosecond. But a, a, a forwarding delay on a, on a transport device could already cost multiple microseconds. So what we do is really kind of negligible compared to the other uh, equipment uh, consumes. So at the end, this has to be kind of checked end to end, so to say. Okay, let's move because there are more questions. Okay, so uh, John from Micro R, uh, would you like to make the question? Sure, I think uh, Francesco touched on it a little bit. Um, my question was about the number of channels. I know uh, NGPON2 has, uh, has a specification of you know, four to eight or possibly a bit more, but, uh, and that can be chosen by a provider, but is there a limit to going to a higher number of channels or a disadvantage, or is that just the current state of affairs and that's the current standard people are working with? The, what is uh, uh, already standardized are eight wavelengths. Uh, in this normal approach, but it, there is also a PTP uh, standardized in NGPON2. So the, the standard of NGPON2, the standards also created 
not only the point to multi point uh, approach for to way to avalanche uh, but uh, there is also a ptp window in the 1600 nanometers around that so okay. if one can also increase on on that direction can i have a short comment on this fabio speaking thank sure. you so sure. uh, in mobile transport, we need more than eight wavelengths, and you are right, and she point to specifies point to point options. But uh, we have uh, seen that uh, uh, there is a lack of a tunable filter over this uh, enhanced number of channels, which are key enabled for the uh, and she point to or split option over this. Uh, uh, for this kind of application. Can you comment about uh, the tunable filters for uh, 20 channels or 16 channels or, and so on? At, at sufficient low cost, of course, there are tunable filters, but we are speaking about <laughs> low cost tunable filters. Yeah. Sure. Um, this, this, I think it should also be a very good question for Ioponics. Francois made the question before. I think if Jose and then allowed, you may also uh, open the mic. Uh, but uh, from our side, it is definitely what, what you said. So on our devices, on the ON side, we do have a, a tunable filter there, uh, which is uh, tuned uh, by temperature. But also the operators want uh, some devices that have uh, high temp operation, C temp operation. So then uh, you are um, not blocked, but uh, you have a trade off the temperature of operation uh, and the control of the, the thermal uh, temperature that, that, you, that you want to, 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 to support. And then the cost, uh, definitely, because if I can put a big uh, um, cooling device or heating device and then go and tune the granularity that I want. So there is, there is a big trade-off, but I think that Francois also has a, a good answer for this topic. Okay, very good. Thank you for this discussion. I think Jim from AG also had a uh, comment about the wavelength uh, band. Well, yeah, I guess it's following on um, what Pick Advance just said. It's, it's a good uh, alley-oop, I guess, because the as, as I've looked deeper into our, our pond transceiver manu manufacturing and the costs involved, I've learned, because uh, I come from a WDM background, so you would think just using more channels, you just keep pumping up the number of channels, you get more bandwidth. The pond is a little bit different. And I've found the, the, the filters, yeah, you can buy filters, but our number one expense is the, is the slope of the filters, the amount of guard band, and the test time to guarantee over these telco temperature ranges that you can guarantee your lasers will always be held within the safety zone of their allocated band and they're not going to slip out and a filter is not going to shift and this all needs to be guaranteed in what is essentially one of the highest volume lowest margin parts we make so while from a wdm perspective yeah you can always add more channels from a pond perspective there are hidden costs and difficulties incurred as you bump up from you know two to four to eight and try to increase the channel count so it's not it, it, it's not just as simple as adding more color sometimes with pond Okay, thank you very much for all these comments. Uh, let's go for the last question, okay? Uh, Amir from CSEM, uh, would you like to make the question by yourself? Yes, uh, thank you so much, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, actually this question is for Francisco. I mean, uh, since uh, I me mean, at the end you ask about the, you know, like uh, the collaboration for the founders, uh, I actually want to, you know, come back to this question of what are the actually uh, the main building blocks you're actually looking into, you know, platform? I mean, besides obviously, you know, faster modulators is the obvious case, but, uh, what other actually, you know, sort of capabilities like, you know, uh, you, you mentioned about the filters, but you have more specs like tuning time, uh, like uh, range or other things, AWGs, for example. So the, the, um, the architectures are in full development. Uh, we, we have reached the first iterations uh, and we are very happy with the first results that we are having, but uh, we are progressing. Uh, always looking forward to the evolution of the PDKs of the foundries, but I would say that key uh, for uh, this NGPON2 tunable technologies is definitely 
would be definitely the, the laser, okay? Um, and also, we know it uh, might be uh, the integrated and compact uh, AWGs uh, uh, or other type of filtering that allow either to have uh, low loss um, coupling between the different platforms or to be integrated in a, in a laser platform. Uh, and with the um, manufacturing repeatability so that we can have a full wafer centered at the same type, centered around the, the, wa the wafer, because ng.2 is very tight on, on the specifications. You always have to have this uh, 100 G um, grid uh, centered at the same channels to be used in the network. It's not like DWDM where you have a, a big set of channels uh, and you can yield from the wafer the other ones. Here we are very targeted on a specific wavelengths. Thank you. But uh, please contact me and I think we, we should discuss uh, uh, in more detail, definitely. My Absolutely. email is available. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Super interesting discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Francisco, for this, uh, for this talk, for this discussion. And now let's move to the last uh, but not least presentation of today. So, Francois from Expo. Hello. Yes, hi. Can you hear me you okay? Like share, yes, we can hear you very well. And now you want to share your and screen. I'm sharing my screen. Can Perfect. you see it? Good. Okay. Um, so, um, well, th thank you again for um, the opportunity to, uh, for me to present uh, Expo's point of view, if you want, or perspective on the, uh, the challenges in actually testing the 5G components. So um, giving you a bit of a, an insight on, on our own uh, challenges. Um, and since Expo just joined Epic uh, in 2020, it was last year, uh, I thought I would start with uh, introducing the, uh, uh, the company first. So Expo has been helping customers uh, testing their fiber optics uh, for about 35 years now, a bit more than 35 years. Um, we propose uh, an extended portfolio of products and services that extend from uh, the development of new components in the laboratory to the manufacturing, from installation to maintenance and validation uh, in the field. And we even go further uh, and provide uh, live monitoring of the health of the network and troubleshooting tools. So we accompany the customers from the lab to uh, live. And uh, when it comes to 5G testing, particularly our portfolio is uh, composed of uh, uh, these type of equipment here. So at the top, we have uh, the equipment dedicated to laboratories and manufacturing for uh, development of uh, the components themselves. Uh, in the middle, we have the, uh, the equipment dedicated to field applications such as uh, fiber connection inspection, uh, OTDR, portable, portable um, link validation equipment, and also at the bottom, uh, software tools for uh, serv service assurance uh, solution. So these instruments highlighted in yellow, um, component tester, beta rate tester, uh, sampling scope, and uh, the fiber inspection probe are all new or have been updated in the last few months with new functionalities uh, to address the requirement for uh, the 5G testing. So these instruments uh, are, are key to uh, correctly testing the, uh, the components in the 5G context. So in R&D lab, and we've discussed uh, a lot uh, during this meeting, we see uh, photonic integrated circuit technology evolving rapidly. And, uh, and I'll talk a bit more in the next few slides about that. Um, but there are also other uh, passive components for 5G network that are more complex than before. There are reconfigurable devices. And here's a test speed, the reliability can actually weigh uh, the same as the CapEx and uh, um, we need to find ways to, to actually be able to test that. Uh, further down the production line, uh, the diversity of the transceivers, and we've talked extensively about these, uh, is exploding different technologies, different higher speeds, tunability, uh, we just uh, talked about it right now, 
is also introduced and so um but one key difference here also or difficulty i should say is the many different form factors uh, and the challenge is to be able to offer testing uh, quickly reliably and to uh, uh, this extended range of transceivers and that's that was the idea actually behind the uh, the open transceiver system that uh, was developed uh, at expo and the last use case uh, for installation of new equipment throughout the 5g infrastructure and particularly uh, on the transport portion where the, the test difficulties come from uh, the multiple multiple protocols and once again, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, the need for ultra high reliability uh, and the coexistence of both the, the, the new 5G gear and existing 5G solutions. So you still need to, to be able to test uh, all that together. So um, I want to take some time to, uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, the stuff I know a bit more, which is the, uh, the, the, the peak based component testing. And uh, here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the peak at the heart of uh, the 5G transformation being uh, now included in, in transceivers. Faster, more compact, cheaper, uh, and consuming less energy. But from a, a test and measurement perspective, the challenge here is to be able to test both active and passive components on the chip. Sometimes you have to test it on the wafer itself um, and test it fast because there's a large volume of these chips being manufactured. Um, and then you need to be able to test at different stages, uh, wafer, die level, et cetera. Um, so usually it goes for a complex test station uh, where you need to needs to be simplified if we want to achieve uh, mass production of these devices. And so here to answer these particular requirements, uh, we've developed spectral uh, test solutions uh, with uh, an optical spectrum analyzer, OSA20 on, on the right hand side, and a component testing platform CTP10 on the, the left hand side, both initially developed for R&D in PEAK. Uh, so with state of the art performance when it comes to speed and accuracy uh, of the measurement, and both instruments have a, a simple intuitive interface and full automation uh, so that it takes away a lot of the configuration, scanning, analyzing, uh, all that by hand. Um, so for example, the, the OSA20 offers a suite of analysis such as OSNR or side mode suppression ratio directly on the instrument itself. And uh, we can see on the, on the right hand side here, a little uh, um, a video where we have a CTP10 interface with two ring resonators being measured uh, successively over 100 nanometers per second in a matter of, of seconds. So that was just a, a quick overview of the challenges we face on the, uh, the test measurement front. And I hope that you can see that. Uh, and, and to the questions that's coming, uh, we um, can work together uh, that to, to achieve the best testing solution uh, by uh, simply letting us know what, uh, what's coming next. So on that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. Actually, I'm very excited to have uh, Expo as a member of EPIC. Welcome to the big family of photonics technologies. Uh, Francois, many companies are now, uh, many companies in the metrology sector are now interacting with uh, with companies in the packaging. You know, companies like Accentech, like Ficon Tech, like Amicra, like I will find tech. I kind of mention all of them. Um, this is the target, right? To work together with the equipment manufacturers and make sure that we can do the wafer level testing of these transceivers, correct? Yes, yeah, that's right. And uh, we have uh, done a few partnerships. Um, uh, actually, last year we went to OFC with uh, MPI and Hewlett Packard. Uh, so MPI is uh, based in Taiwan, uh, and we had uh, we had uh, a demonstrator at the show showing the uh, the the simplicity of the system because uh, our CTP10 was integrated very easily into their alignment probe station. So that's one example. Um, the other example is uh, a work we, we've done with uh, with Aponix and uh, and Maple Leaf Photonics, which has uh, been published very recently. And I, I would like to also congratulate Iponics for the amazing work they're doing on the silicon nitrate with MEMS integration. I am going to, to have a, a round of discussion now because I have a lot of questions in the chat, but the first one is coming to you, Francois. We're talking a lot about latency, and I know X4 is extremely good at network testing. How can we help all these people answering the question if the latency measurement? 
Um, so this is actually one 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 part of the the, the testing that I'm uh, I'm not responsible for. So I know it's possible to um, to test latency. I, I I unfortunately I'm not the expert on that. Uh, what I can talk about, though, however, is uh, the fact that with uh, with the CTP10, which is uh, the, the particular instrument I showed, we can use uh, OFDR. And with OFDR, you can test latency, for example. So that's one one particular aspect of our our system that we can uh, uh, we can use. Thank you very much, Francois. And once again, welcome to Epic. Uh, I have to address a few topics before I close the meeting. The first one, when I talk to Francois Menard from Iponics, we constantly talk about the addition of more channels. And you post something in the chat about adding more channels actually increases the crosstalk. Uh, we have some questions for you from Jim, but Francois, could you elaborate on that topic? And then I will give the floor to Jim so he can address the beauty of Pong. Sure. Um... Well, I, this goes to uh, Fabio's uh, comment, uh, and uh, I think it's it's fair to say that going on forward, uh, the densification of front hall uh, will welcome more channels than four or eight as we are currently accustomed to. And um, everybody knows that when you build a filter, uh, the uh, quality of the filter, especially a DWDM filter, uh, the, by which it is measured is by its isolation between channels. And uh, the, the, the number of interferers uh, it, uh, causes a reduction in the sensitivity of the receiver. So it's a catch-22 to uh, optimize the uh, link budget uh, and minimize the crosstalk penalty. And uh, this is something that is being reviewed right now in, uh, for instance, uh, the current standardization at the ITU for the uh, uh, evolution of NGPON2 called HSP TWDM. Uh, uh, and uh, and um, uh, the fellow from ADVA was uh, very good at pointing that uh, there is uh, also an issue with chromatic dispersion and uh, at higher bit rates, and that also has to be taken into consideration. But for instance, if you consider that 10 kilometer front hall is good enough, you can do many channels at 25 gig and, uh, and you can minimize crosstalk penalty and you can have uh, the best of both worlds. So we are uh, evaluating this in the standards uh, cycles. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, equipment from Expo is really useful for measuring the crosstalk penalty on our filters. It is fantastic. And your partnership with them is a success story. Francois, also congratulations on the integration of MEMS with Silicon Nitrate is actually top notch. But Jim, Jim from, from Adva has posted, the beauty of Pong is really time division multiplexing. Jim. What's on your mind to close the meeting because you've been the star today. I always give us a gold star. Today goes to Adva. Okay, yeah, I think there are two different things we're talking about here. I mean, the the, the wavelength multiplexing is um, kind of uh, mentioned in both uh, kind of uh, a pong uh, uh, standard, but also a traditional point to point uh, WDM multiplexing. So I think uh, for for pong, as I said, the 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 beauty is really this kind of a best effort uh, multiplexing. This is the way that it could really reduce the cost and also the save the fiber resource. Um, so then uh, on top, then uh, adding the W WDM actually does not get rid of the, 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 the protocol stack of the Pong. So you still have a, um, let's say, kind of an intermediate transport protocol in Pong um, adding on top of the front hall transport. So you have like a two stacks in, in together, adding together. And then speaking of the isolation, I think that's a really a good point because this is again, uh, like uh, unlike the traditional uh, WDM deployment, because in most cases, the, the future will be deployed in a field which requires much harder uh, kind of temperature resistance or kind of uh, temperature reliability. So this indeed incurs a lot of uh, requirement on, on the future uh, implementation. But on the other side, regarding the channel counts, that, that's actually another thing because it, it's, it's, it does not necessarily um, uh, say that um, adding more channels is the requirement or is the demand because you also need to think about the, the network topology and also deployments. If you have uh, so many channels, how would you 
allocate your filter in your transport network. Just imagine that you have a spread out of multiple radio antennas. How would you place such a filter which multiplex 40 channels, 90 channels in a location which could feed or distribute to all these kind of uh, 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 scattered um, uh, radio sites. So you the, were really the star today. And that was that was a very well deserved gold star, your first ever epic meeting. And today was really fascinating. We talked first about the timing yeah. being a big issue with great learnings. We also talk about interactive photonics and solving the volume and scale. I don't want to mention cost. Solving the self-tuning and the technologies of effect photonics were highlighted and the standardization. Very happy that that was already interacting with PixUp. We talk about the overall fiber capacity. I was thinking that we're going to talk about frequency ranges, but we talk a lot about L band and O band and the need to go into that. We also talk about hollow core and multi-core solutions for new fiber solutions. And we also talk a little bit about a change in the architecture. I really love the meeting and I really love especially that so many companies today here in the Zoom room, WhatsApp me and also in the YouTube channel were interacting with the members. It was really a great, great day with all these companies. Thank you very much for supporting. For me, I just want to say that even though the meeting looks like it finished now, it didn't. The meeting really starts now. Now it's time for the most important part of the meeting, which is the follow-up. We need to make sure that you interact with the companies who can do business with you. So try to make sure that after this meeting, you connect with at least one company. If you want to be introduced to any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.pothanatepic.com, and I will make the introductions. I love doing that. I love, to, I love seeing that after these meetings, so many things happen, so many interactions, so many conference calls. This is really so great. So on behalf of a super team with a medical specialist, Nebele Kaya, an interactive photon specialist, Anna Gonzalez, a laser specialist, Francesca Moglia, a quantum specialist, Sana Pica, the best innovation manager in the world, Tino Raspa, the marketing and event organizers, Anna Pfizer, CFO, and the heart, Carlos Lee. Thank you very much for making me so happy. I'm here showing you the calendar of online technology meetings for Q1 all the way to 31st of March. To write down the one on the 3rd of March. Roma 2021 for co-package optics with the great companies in the co-packaging that can put together. Until the next time, be epic. Take care of each other. Wash your hands, put a mask. Be nice. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. The formal part of the meeting is over. We are no longer live in YouTube.